it is great to praise with you today. Man, what a good time. Good job. And uh, we're going to be spending eternity doing that. So I'm glad we get some good practice now. That was excellent. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we turn to the book of Psalm, chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12. And uh, speaking of glory, we'll be seeing our uh, sisters in glory soon. Sylvia Ketcher is now at home with the Lord. And of course, we uh, uh, celebrate that. And. Uh, and also Donna David. So continue to pray for those families that are bereaved. Uh, and uh, but praise the Lord for the reality of the gospel in their life. Psalm chapter 12 this morning. I'm going to continue our series in the preserved word. And we're going to be, or I'm sorry, about the, <clears throat> the, uh, the, world to the, wor- the word to the world. I'm sorry, we've been talking about that for the last couple weeks. I'm going to be specifically addressing the preserved word this morning. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, be going to Psalm chapter 12. Uh, last week we saw the uh, we talked about the written word. The word the week before that we talked about the eternal word. And so, uh, you know, I've been told that uh, the only way to spot a phony right is to know the real thing. And uh, I've been told that in a banking industry that the tellers uh, know how to spot a counterfeit by dealing and, and handling the real uh, the real currency. Is that true, Tracy? So. Uh, so don't try to pass anything off on Tracy or any tellers, right? Because they know the real thing. They know currency. They deal with it all the time. They know when it's authentic and when it's not. And, of course, the counterfeit gets pulled out because it's of no value. So uh, I, this morning I just want to take some time. And as we're talking about this theme of the word to the world, and we're getting geared up for our Bible conference, uh, we're going to be uh, preparing to literally lay our hands on the assembling of the word of God to get it where it needs to go on time. And uh, we have had a, uh, a change of plan uh, be based on God's providence. The printers gave us a, well, not us, but Bearing Precious Seed, who were printing the Arabic Bibles, were not able to, um, well, they delivered the wrong paper. So uh, because of the time frame we have, we're, they're not going to be able to print the Arabic Bibles, which is a bummer. So everybody go, oh, bummer. It is a bummer. But God in his providence has, a, has another plan, and that is uh, he's going to have us do 10,000 Burmese Bibles uh, for Myanmar, which is also, yeah, so, so, yeah, yeah, awesome, so we're going to get to do that instead, and uh, I was talking to Sam, I was really like, man, Sam, we're all geared up, he's going to Lebanon, guess what, he just got back from Burma, so I'm like, well, that's awesome, he's just taught at a Bible college over there, he has contacts on the ground in Burma, so wouldn't you know, so praise the Lord for that, so God's got it all worked out, so we're going to be putting our hands on the Word of God, in addition to, by the way, uh, producing some more Bibles uh, here in the, in the English uh, for distribution in Cass County because we're running out of those finally. Praise God, we've been getting the Word out, getting the seed out of the barn, which is our theme last year. And, uh, and so that's all happening, and so it's time to reproduce some more of those. And, and God is good because He is using us to get the Word out. And this morning, I just want you to look at Psalm chapter 12. Because we take for granted the reality that we have the Bible. Uh, you have a Bible in your hands. You're here this morning. I, I've got a Bible laying up here on the pulpit. We are just accustomed to that. But, uh, you know, that's really a blessing of God. And I want you to look at Psalm chapter 12 with me. Psalm chapter 12 and verse 1. Let's stand as we read God's word. If you haven't read your Bible today, you're going to read a whole chapter this morning. Psalm chapter 12 and verse 1. Notice the first word <clears throat> help lord for the godly man ceaseth for the faithful fail from among the children of men they speak vanity every one with his neighbor with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak the lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things who have said with our tongue we will prevail our lips are our own Who is the Lord over us for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy? Now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. Verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to just take some time 
these several weeks and prepare our hearts to assemble the Word of God, to be part of a process to get the Word where it needs to go on time, literally to a people, in this case, who are oppressed by the very people that are described in this passage. O oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promise that your Word is preserved, your Word is purified. To every generation, you've preserved your Word. And so that means, Lord, we know that today you have given us your word. You can give us confidence in your word. Lord, we thank you for the word of God. Without it, we would be darkness, as Ron was just pointing out. Not just in darkness, but we would be darkness. Thank you for your glorious light. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the word of God. We pray your blessing upon the reading, the hearing, the application of the word of God. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buzz through this because we, we got to, if I can get through it all. But I really want to take some time here and talk about the preserved word. Number one, the preserved word is our source of faith. It is a source of faith. Many of you know Romans 10, 17. We quote it all the time. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? Word of God, right? 1 Peter 1, 23, the Bible is very clear. We are born again, right? It says being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. <clears throat> we, we got, we're not up? Okay, sorry. Um, the preserved word, uh, get your pencils ready if you're taking notes, because you're going to need to take some notes this morning. The, preser the preserved word provides also assurance. It provides assurance. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. 1 John 5, 13. Bible says in 1 John 5, now see if I get there, you should get there, all right? It's 1 John 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. This is a very important passage in my own personal life. Years ago, uh, I, had, I was saved, and I, I mean, I knew I was saved. I was altered uh, radically. Uh, and my salvation, but even some, some just some uh, time after that, you know, God uh, or the devil and the flesh and the world uh, started having some doubts because I didn't always feel saved. Anybody ever have a day like that? You don't feel saved. You know all the right answers. You know the gospel. You know the plan of salvation. You ask Jesus to come in your heart over and over again. How many times can you ask to come in your heart? You know. Uh, and God gave me this passage: "These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know." Uh, because sometimes uh, we forget that our assurance, that our faith is based in the word of God itself. That you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. If you're basing your faith on anything outside the word of God, you're, you're getting sketchy. It's the word of God. And uh, after I settled that issue and, and I went back over just the, the basics of what the word of God said and I claimed it once again and I was like, Lord, uh, this is all I have to trust. And you know what? God just brought a peace over my heart and never... Never doubt it again. Never doubt it again. Why? Because faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God produces faith. The Word of God produces life. The Word of God, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it provides assurance. It gives us all the promises, all the hope that we have is found in the Word of God. Now, destroying our faith in the Word of God is Satan's primary objective. Genesis chapter 3. You guys know the passage. Go back there. Genesis chapter 3 and uh, verse 1. Genesis 3. And verse 1. And you guys know the story of Adam and Eve, but I want you to just pay particular attention to verse 1 this morning. It says in Genesis 3 and verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Okay, we know that. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And he comes with questions. Yea, hath God said. Satan desires to cast a shadow of doubt upon God's word. Satan d doesn't care if you have faith in him as long as you don't have faith in God. That's why Jesus responded to the temptation in Matthew 4 and Luke 4 with what? Class? Right, the word of God. He responded to temptation with the word of God. So you must be certain you have God's word if you're going to stand on God's word. You've got to know that you have it or you're not able to stand upon it. Why did Eve waver? Because she wasn't sure what God said for whatever reason. 
And that could have been Adam's fault. It could have been her fault. We don't know. We're not left to, we're left to, 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 uh, to guess on that because I think all of those options are uh, something we wrestle with. Now, uh, the preserved word produces faith. And we know there's an adversary trying to destroy our faith in the word of God. Now, you must, you, you, uh, must be certain you have God's word if you're going to stand on God's word. Now, Psalm chapter 12, and verse 7, where we started, uh, that passage is very clear. It says, Thou shalt keep them. Now, who's thou? Well, that's God. O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The words of God, not the children of Israel, in verse 6. Uh, some of the other translations say it's the children of Israel. No, it is not. Look at it in the, you can look at it in the Hebrew. You can look at it in the English, at least the authorized version. It's dealing with the words of God. The words of God are what is going to be preserved uh, to this generation forever. God makes a promise there in the book of Psalm. Now, Satan knows Psalms chapter 12 and verse 7, and that's why he has done everything in his power to pervert it, to stop it, and to twist it. The Romans dumbed it down in the Latin. The Catholics banned it from being read. The Church of England chained it to the pulpit, and the crown burned it. The scholars have, have uh, twisted it and perverted it, and the publishing house has almost made the Word of God obscure at times through the plethora of translations and paraphrases. Daniel B. Wallace, uh, who himself is a, is a uh, textual critic, <clears throat> um, this is what he says about the originals. He, he is quoted as saying 98% of the standard Greek and New Testaments, uh, he's talking about the majority text and uh, the ancient text, uh, <clears throat> he says 98% of the standard Greek New Testaments vary less than 2% from the Texas Receptus, and that is what your King James Bible has been translated from. I was like, wow, this is a new thing to me. I just actually found this uh, this week. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Mr. Wallace, he's a, he's a noted professor down at, uh, down at Dallas Theological, and he, has, uh, he makes his living uh, doing textual criticism. If Dr. Wallace is correct, then why in the world do we need so many variant readings if it's only 2% of a difference in his estimation from the Texas Receptus? If that's the case, then why do Mr. Wallace and his colleagues have so much heartburn over my desire to claim that I've got the Bible in my language, if that's what we're talking about? I don't understand. What's the problem? Without error, that's the problem. Because I've got to know this. I mean, I'm, not, I'm being facetious here. I've got to know that there's an error in my Bible. Somebody's got to tell me that every time I open it up. I can't be sure of the Word of God. Beloved, I just don't believe that because Psalm chapter 12 tells me different. And it's important because what you stand on is what you stand on. And that's what you have to face the onslaught of the devil. I'm a little passionate about this, so I'm going to stay on note today. There are seven translations of the English Bible, not counting the Catholic Dewey Reams. I don't count that from the Latin Vulgate in the 16th and 17th century. The culmination of these seven translations, ultimately, I think many of you know, would be the King James, or what we call the Authorized Version. Its subsequent revisions for grammar and spelling uh, came along through the 1700s. So I'm not so, like, I don't have an Old English 1611 copy of the King James Bible, okay? I'm not that anal about this thing, okay? There's room for that. There's room for grammar and editing and all that. But the bottom line is, God preserved his word. He brought us a Bible. Praise God. Hallelujah. The whole English world has been transformed by it there's no doubt about it you can't argue that and uh, that's just the way it is that's history now the 20th century starting with the um or in the 18th and 19th century i'm sorry there were eight more translations added and none of them serious, seriously rivaled the authorized version or really even claimed to uh, in the 20th century though uh starting with the asv american standard version the revised standard version one in england one in britain uh, that century brought 37 translations and most of those were the last half of the 20th century. Many in this room are old enough to remember when the authorized version, this Bible that I have right here, was the standard for English-speaking people. How many of you, just, just I want to do this for my own edification, how many of you remember a time when you said the Bible, and the Bible was the King James Bible? Just raise your hands. In your lifetime. It was when I got saved, 1987, there's really not that many Bibles on the market. Just a few English, other English translations. Even then, the, the prime, one of the primary Bibles, well, you know, a quarter century ago was was um, when you put yourself in context as a quarter of a century, you know, you're getting old. But uh, <laughs> but it was it was the authorized version. That just was the Bible. 
uh, in the 1950s, the primary Bible everybody was using in the English language was the, was the key. Now, I'm not saying it was exclusive. There were people that had other translations. But it was the, the, the English-speaking Bible. I'd say 50% of you raised your hands. You can remember those days. Now, in this century alone, you may not be surprised to find out that there are already... Now, I said 37 translations in the whole 20th century. In this century alone, right now, I'm talking since 2000 forward. Throw a guess. How many, how many new translations do we have? Anyone want to guess? No, not that many. How many? Seven? That's good. Now double that. We got 14. We got 14. It's 2013. All right? So you got 14 new English translations. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's all working to improve and update the text, of course, supposedly. And uh, I did the math on this. So if you keep up the pace through the next century, should the Lord tarry, which I don't think will happen, there would be 107 to 108 in this century alone. At this pace that we're keeping, there would be at least 107 to 108 English translations of the Bible. With that 2% variance, right? Cranking out a more exact word. Yeah, whatever. I think if I owned a publishing house, it would be good for me because I could keep my people busy every year. Now you tell me if one of the textual critics tells me there's only a 2% variation between Westcott and Hort and Nestle and Metzger and the majority text, the Alexandrian text, and the received text, then why in the world are we averaging one new Bible a year? I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. I just, I'm just giving you the facts. I just, I'm, not, it's just, I'm just reporting the news, guys. I don't make it. But I, I would suggest this. Maybe it's, yay, hath God said. Do we know what God says? No, not unless you study Greek and Hebrew. You do not know. And obviously, even those guys don't know because they can't settle on anything. If there were no doctrinal differences, I wouldn't be up here talking much about it. I wouldn't even be that concerned about it. But the reality is there are doctrinal differences. Men like Westcott and Hort, who were among the first textual critics to translate the Greek New Testament and then the Hebrew Bible, from the majority in the Alexandrian manuscripts chose, chose variant readings that clearly were not the best, but instead settled on their doctrinal position of baptism regeneration. And for those of you that aren't familiar with that term, that means they held a position that you were saved, not by grace through faith alone in the finished work of Christ, but in works, right, in, in, in getting baptized, sprinkled, being, uh, being brought into the church through a work, not in trusting the Lord Jesus Christ alone and his uh, finished work. And so uh, <clears throat> these manuscripts uh, clearly indicate that and that doctrinal position. Uh, th they did this by choosing, supposedly, the oldest is best philosophy uh, when it was convenient for their doctrine. They didn't always apply that, but when it wor worked out for what they wanted to prove, that's what they went with. And they relied heavily upon the Sinai Vaticanus, the Greek text found in the monastery in the trash can in 1844, the Titian Dorsch, uh, supposedly reclaimed there and went back in 1853 and he got all the uh, manuscripts so the manuscripts may lean <coughs> uh, that they lean on I'm sorry that many lean on for an accurate translation were not even taken seriously by the monks that were keep, keeping them in the monastery that's why they were in such good shape nobody was using them at all because not even the Catholics considered them a re reliable translation until the advent of textual criticism now, I don't have to be a Greek or a Hebrew scholar to know that Isaiah 14, 12 is speaking of Lucifer. It says Lucifer in your King James Bible. Lucifer fell from where, class? Heaven. That's what the text says. And you don't have to be a scholar to know that. That's not Jesus falling from heaven. But many of the modern texts would tell you that. And I have no doubt that the debate over textual criticism will continue to rage and the marketplace will continue to be flooded with new translations, all claiming to be better and better and so on and so forth and clearer and easier and fun to read until the Antichrist comes, okay? So that's fine. I'm not going to argue that. And, and by the way, taking this position, I'm gonna, people are going to scoff. They're going to laugh. They're going to say, you are an uneducated man. Well, okay, I'll take that. But I believe this, that it's, it's a satanic smokescreen, the whole thing, to provide cover and confusion so the coming man of sin will appear 
And by the way, I bet he has a solution to the problem. He'll be very clear on what the Bible says because he'll claim to be the author of it. And I'm not ashamed to claim to have the word of God in English. I'm not ashamed to say it's in my hands. It makes the scholar mad. But Psalm chapter 12 tells me that God preserves his word to every generation. That's what I'm standing on. And if he could keep it in the Hebrew, if he could keep it in the Arabic, if he can keep it in the Greek, then, beloved, he can keep it in the English. So the preserved word of God is the source of faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You've got to know where you stand. And don't stand there because I stand there, by the way. That's not good. It's got to be a conviction that's in your heart because you studied the authentic thing. When you study the word of God, like a teller would st- see all those different currencies, they know the real thing because they've dealt with it. The preserved word is, a biblic- is biblical, biblically and historic, uh, biblical and historic reality. Sorry, I'm tumbling over my words today. The word of God is a biblical and historical reality. And I want you to get your Bibles ready and limbered up. Because one of the reasons that I am such a hardcore uh, Bible believer in this, in this regard is because of the text itself. Because of what the Bible says about itself. I, I don't really care what everybody else says. What does God say? Turn to Exodus 24 and verse 4. Exodus 24 and verse 4. I can remember getting this in my daily reading some years ago. And it lit me up. Exodus 24 and verse 4. Let's just start in verse 1. Exodus 24. Now, guys, I'm going to need to move briskly, so you're going to have to keep up with me. All right? Exodus 24 and verse 1. And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. Verse 3. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments, and, uh, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said we will do. We talked about this last week. Verse 4. And notice what it says. And Moses, what did he do? He wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and the 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Moses communed with God. God uh, supernaturally, of course, his word is inspired. And Moses then inscripturizes, right? He puts the word down in writing. God's hands all over that. It's a common thing in the Old Testament. Now go to down to verse 12. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there. I like that. And I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. Okay. So we have the, the, the inspired word of God that we've already talked about in the last several weeks. He is literally, he is, he is, he is, he is speaking to Moses, man. And Moses is writing it down. We've got the original manuscript right there with Moses. And on top of it, God is going to give him some tablets that are his to take home. Right from the finger of God, written on the front and the back. Can you imagine that? How would you like God to just drop some tablets on you today? And you can go start a whole cult. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm just kidding. Some of you get that. Anyway. So, for, so those who need the original autographs, we got them right here. Moses had them. Somewhere, they, they existed. But I got some bad news. Go to chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. Well, this is not so bad of news. This is kind of neat. So God meets with Moses. We, we get to the kind of end. I'm going to have to skip over some things here. It says, And God gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him, upon Mount Sinai, Sinai Two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. And God wrote it. That's the original autograph right there. I mean, you can't deny And it's in stone. Praise the Lord. Now go to chapter 32. And I don't have time to get into all this, but you know the story, right? Because you've seen Charlton Heston go through it. And, uh, and so, 
So he's up on the mountain, and uh, he's up there communing with God. That's what it says. Got the tables, the whole thing. Okay, you got it. Then what? they're having a party, man. They got a rock concert going on down there, and uh, everyone's getting naked, and, and not, I'm not kidding. And uh, they've taken their gold. They made the molten cat. I mean, it's, it's angering God. God's ready to kill them. Moses is like, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, God, don't do that. I mean, you, this is your people. You've already called them out, and, you know, have mercy and grace and all of that. And, and of course, we know what happens. Uh, Moses comes down there. Now he's honked off, verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand, and the tables were written on both their sides very clearly. That's been stated now uh, two or three times in the, in the text. Uh, on the one side and on the other were they written, and the tables uh, were the work of God. That's the original autograph, man. And the, and the writing was, was the writing of God graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it, and it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh into the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands, and he broke them beneath the mount. Oh my gosh, we just lost the original manuscripts. <laughs> oh, the original autograph just got destroyed because Moses got honked off. That's what happened. But wait, oh no. What are we going to do? We'll never know what the Ten Commandments really are, will we? We don't really know if we've got the Ten Commandments because they, they hit the ground. No one can know the Ten Commandments now, can they? Of course, I'm being facetious. Of course we know the Ten Commandments. Let's go to Exodus 34. Exodus chapter 34, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write unto... I will write upon these tables the words that are in the first tables which thou breakest. Do you mean to tell me God can remember what he said? That's right. He knows what he said. It's awesome. He knows what he said. And, and he says, now, but this time, Moses, you need to hew out the tables. You take those tables. And uh, verse 2, and, and, and be ready in the morning and, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen uh, throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. So he wants it to be holy and set apart. Verse 4, And he hewed two tables of stone like the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up into the Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. So now we don't have the plasma cutter like Charlton Heston. Now we got Moses... You know, he's actually hewing these things out, and he's taking them up just as God told him to do. And uh, so that's, that began the process. Now, the account's very clear. Just skip up to verse 27. Verse 27, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, this is what God told Moses, Write thou these words. I'm just going to take a second there and let you look at that. Write thou these words. For after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel, and was there with the Lord, and he was, I'm sorry, he, being Moses, was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So who, okay, class, who wrote those Ten Commandments? God wrote them, but who used, whose hand was on the tablet? Moses, that's what it says, right? Is that what it says? Am I, if I'm not reading it right, just tell me. That's what it says. Now, go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 10. I beat you. Verse 1. And the time that the Lord <clears throat> said unto, unto me. Now Moses is writing. It's the second giving of the law. Forty years later. He's getting the, the nation of Israel ready to enter the promised land. Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. And come up unto, into the mount and make thee an ark of wood. And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. And thou shalt put them in the ark. 
This is what Moses says. I made an ark of shittim wood and hewed two tables of stone like unto the first and went up into the mount having the two tables in my hand. Verse 4. And he wrote on the tables according to the first writing the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them unto me. Uh-oh, we have a contradiction. No, we don't. What we have is preservation. See, God not only, does, he doesn't forget what he said, but he's actually able to use a human instrument and allow him to pin this thing or to put it down in the stone, and he's able to call it his handwriting because God preserved his word. So the, the ark of the, the tablets that went in the ark of the covenant was the tablets that God wanted. That was the words, that, those were the words of God. Regardless of whether God wrote it with his finger or, or he used Moses to, to sketch it in there, those were the words of God because God can do that. He's a big God. He didn't lose his original. You see, we, we, have, we have here a bona fide example of God using human instruments that are flawed and sinful. Moses didn't, remember, he is not entering the promised land. Why? Because he's got a temper tantrum problem, right? He's the guy that, that smote the rock, and he, and he wasn't supposed to, and, and, he, and, and so he was supposed to speak to it. And so Moses is not a perfect, flawless, sinless monk in a monastery. The guy had a temper problem. It kept him from going into the promised land, and yet God used him, an imperfect vessel, to produce a perfect word that we call the Ten Commandments. The second copy of the law is stored in the Ark of the Covenant, so at least we can find that thing once we get a hold of, of uh, Harrison Ford. <laughs> right? I'm kidding. I don't think you're going to find it on this earth right now. So Paul told Timothy, he knew the Holy Scripture, 2 Timothy 3.15. I'm going to read this for time's sake. This is what Paul said to Timothy, his disciple. And from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. From a child, Timothy, you've, you've known the Holy Scriptures. Did he, have the, did he have the Ark of the Covenant at his house? No. He had a copy, right? God preserved his word. He didn't have the original Ten Commandments. Did he have the original Hebrew scroll, scrolls in his possession? I doubt that, very seriously. What about the Arabic or the Greek? Of course not. He had God's word preserved for him very carefully through the process developed by Ezra and the scribes that preserved God's word. God used those guys as well. Now, Peter makes it very clear that the entire process of inspiration and preservation are under the divine oversight of the author of eternal life. In 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, you're going to have to turn there. Uh, go back to 2 Peter chapter 1. And I know this is familiar to many of you, but for some folks, this is the first time they've ever seen this. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse uh, 16. It says, For we have not followed... I'll give you a second to get there. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Peter and, and, uh, and Timothy, are on, or Paul, are on the same page here. He says in verse, uh, verse 16... For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when, <clears throat> when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. More, than, more sure than the audible voice of God? Yes. Wherein too ye do well that you take heed as a light that shineth in dark in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake inspiration as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So God used men, right? He would even speak through just just ordinary men that were obviously holy men, it says there, and he would, he would speak his word through them. And God has given us the Bible. Uh, we don't have the audio tape. We just don't have it. God has given us his word. <clears throat> Peter's point here was not to cast shadows of doubt over the scripture, both verbal or written, but encourage confidence that the revelation they had available was more sure than the audible voice of God. And in this case, the credibility of the, the apostles as God was still developing and, and putting together the New Testament and giving the New Testament covenant. 
And so God is not only able to speak his word, he is able to transfer it to writing to every generation, just like Psalm 12 says. So we see this process again. I want you to go back to, to Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36. <clears throat> and we see this happen again. This isn't just a one-time thing. It's a little different scenario. We're further down the road. Uh, God, God is continuing, uh, continuing to give revelation. Oops. I better get there myself. Jeremiah chapter 36. <clears throat> now this is, a, this is an interesting thing. In verses 1 through 8, Jeremiah, he is, he's got a scribe with him. He's in prison. He can't go out. He is stuck. And he has to get this message out. He's going to send this message to the king of Israel. This is a message for the people of God. And, uh, <clears throat> and in particular, the king. It's a prophecy. Look at verse 1. It says, And it came to pass, Jeremiah 36, 1, came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that the word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, so God gave it to Jeremiah, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations, from the day that I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. So God is commanding here uh, in scripturation. Verse 3. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am shut up, I cannot go to the house of the Lord. Therefore go... Thou and read the roll which thou hast written from my mouth, the words of the Lord, in the ears of the people of the Lord's house upon the fasting day, and also thou shalt read them in the ears of all of Judah that came out of their cities, that it may be well that they. Uh, I'm sorry, that it may be they will re present uh, their supplication before the Lord and will return every one from his evil way, for great is the anger and fury that the Lord hath pronounced against his people, and Baruch. The son of Neriah did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. So we have an incredible picture here of both inspiration, scripturation, a man proclaiming the word of God. Uh, it's exactly how we got our Bible today. Um, and it's, it's a divinely inspired process that Jeremiah was going through. And he transferred the scripture, God put it down on paper, and then that was then repeated, just as I'm doing this morning from the word of God. And so in Jeremiah 36, you would think, obviously, this is going to have a great impact. And it did really upon those that were in the house of the Lord. In, uh, in, verse, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the text there, if you go home and read that later, you can see that uh, they had a very, uh, it did impact the folks that were gathered there, verses 11 through 19. Um, but I'm going to have to fast forward for time's sake down to verse 16. It says, now it came to pass when they had heard all the words, they were afraid, both one another, and said unto Baruch, we will surely tell the king all these words. And they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? Then Baruch answered them, He pronounced all the words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. That's how I did it. He said it, and I wrote it. Just like that. It's that simple. Praise the Lord. Then said the princes unto Baruch, Go hide thee, thou and Jeremiah, and let no man know where you be the words of the lord are powerful look down here in verse 20 and they went into the king in, in the court but they laid up the roll in the chamber of elishama the scribe and told all the words in the ears of the king so the king sent Jude, uh, jehudai to fetch the roll and he took it out of elishama the scribe's chamber and jehudai read it in the ears of the king and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king and they fell on their faces in contriteness. No. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, he, the king, he cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Oh, no, we lost in the manuscripts again. So much for that prophecy. God's all done. 
his original copy. I bet Baruch was thinking, man, I had writer's cramp. <laughs> so that thing got burnt up. It even says in verse 24, yet they were not afraid nor rent their garments, neither did the king or any of his servants that heard all these words. Beloved, if the kings of the earth today would read the Bible and believe it, they would fall on their faces in contriteness at looking at the world events, even today. I mean today. They don't believe the word of God. They're not, they're not, they don't believe it's holy. They don't believe it. I believe this is a clear picture of what happened to Israel. The hardness of heart. Look at verse 27. And then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after that the king had burned the roll and the words which Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah saying, no problem guys, I got this. Take thee again another roll and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll which Jehoiakim the king of Judah hath burned. By the way, I didn't miss that. And thou shalt say to Je Jehoiakim, king of Judah, thus saith the Lord, thou hast burned this roll, saying, why hast thou written there, and say, uh, uh, saying, the king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land, and shall cause to cease from thence man and beast. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out in the day to the heat, and in the night to the frost. And I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity, and I will bring upon them um, <clears throat> and upon the iniquity or the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the men of Judah all the evils that I have pronounced against them, but they hearken not. Verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Je Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and check this out, colon, and there were many added besides unto the, into them many like words. Not only is God's memory good enough to remember what he said to Jeremiah and repeat it in the process of getting the word exactly the way he wants it to be through Baruch, but he's even able to add more information based on Jehoiakim's hard heart. And beloved, I believe we see here a wonderful picture of what happened to the nation of Israel when they rejected the word of God in flesh. What did God do? He has a New Testament. And we hold it in our hands. It's the complete revelation. What does it end with? It ends with a revelation of what? God's wrath. And how God deals justly with all men. Whether king or servant, right? Doesn't matter. We've got the New Testament in his blood. Turn to chapter 51. <coughs> Jeremiah chapter 51. Look down here in verse 59. And the word which Jeremiah the prophet commanded Sariah, the son of Neriah, the son of Ma uh, Messiah, when he went with Zedekiah, the king of Judah, into Babylon in the fourth year of his reign. Some time has passed now. And this Sariah was a quiet prince. So Jeremiah wrote in a book all the evil that should come upon Babylon. Now we're talking Babylon. Even all the words that were written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, when thou comest to Babylon, thou shalt see and shalt read all these words. Then shalt thou say, O Lord, now we have a king that believes the word. Uh, thou hast spoken against this place to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate forever. And it shall be when thou hast made an end of the reading of this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates. And thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. God preserved his word. The preservation of the word of God is not in man's hands, but it's God's divine providence and power. This is why we can trust God to preserve his word to every generation. Where's the, where's the, automat, where's the, uh, the autograph today? It's sunk to the bottom of the Euphrates River. God doesn't give us the benefit. He tells us right up front, you got the book of Jeremiah in your hand, but the original copy is sitting in the bottom of the Euphrates somewhere. Why? Because God preserves his word. God is not bound to the oldest original autograph stuck away in a monastery somewhere. He is well able to circulate the word of God and return it and reconstitute it when he chooses. In Jeremiah 59 uh, through 64 that we just saw, the second version of Jeremiah's book that got tossed in the Euphrates River, it's gone. 
well, I guess it's gone. We don't have the original copy, nonetheless. So we have, we have the one, listen to me, beloved, the one I just read to you, the one I just read to you. Listen, that's the copy of Jeremiah that God wants you to have. Amen. He's given it to us today. It's an incredible prophecy. The Old Testament's incredible. The New Testament is incredible. Beloved, we've got God's word. It's incredible when you think about it, when you ponder that, that God has given us his word. The reason we have an assurance in the preservation of God's word is because it's Jesus himself that is the original autograph. God knew Satan's attack would be on the word of God. So just to drive the point home, the son's proper name is the word of God in John chapter 1. And only a scholar could miss that. The process of God preserving his word perfectly is similar to the way he brought forth Jesus Christ himself. Mary was not immaculately conceived. No, she was a sinner just like you and I. But nonetheless, through her corrupt, sinful body, God brought forth a perfect word. His name is Emmanuel, God with us, and he was and he is the sinless son of God. And he will return, beloved, just like his word says, to accomplish his wrath. And he got in the way of the wrath on the cross so that you and I could be forgiven of sin. And we must believe his word this morning or we won't be saved because that is where faith comes. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This morning we have the first five books of the Bible in our hands. They've been preserved. We have all the Bible in our hands. It's been preserved. We have the book of Jeremiah that was been cut up, that was been burned up, that was been rolled up and tossed in the Euphrates River. Guess what? This morning, beloved, you have the book of Jeremiah in your hands. So the preserved word it's a source of faith. It's a biblical reality, both uh, in, it's a biblical, it's a reality both, I'm sorry, in the Bible and in history. We're holding it in our hands. And the last thing, and I got to wrap this up, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. The preserved word is the source of victory. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 17. 1 Samuel chapter 13. Number of rebellion, number 13. Look at this text. We're just going to skip down to verse 17. <clears throat> as, as you're turning there, I'll just give you a little background. Saul is now the king of the nation of Israel. He's the king that the people chose, not the king that God chose. And God told the, uh, Samuel, that's okay, Samuel. Uh, the, we'll, we'll, we'll roll with this. And if he gets his heart right, I'll even use him. Um, Israel is still really, this is just coming out of the times of judges, right? Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. So they're not a military powerhouse yet. David hasn't come on the scene. Um, and so they're, they're not warring the way that they need to. Uh, but they're going to make some, they're going to tread, they're going to start making some progress. Let me just leave it that way with uh, Saul and Jonathan. But they're in a place right now where they're not able to, to really uh, be very effective. They're not very effectual. So uh, come on down in your text to verse 17. And. Uh, <clears throat> It says here, and the spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned into the way that leadeth the uh, Ophrah, and into the land of Shul. And another company turned the way of Beth Horon. And another company turned to the way of the border that looked to the valley of Zeboam toward the wilderness. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords. Or spears. For all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his maddox. Yet they had a file for the maddox and for the, uh, the coulters and for the forks and for the axes to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with, uh, but with Saul and with Jonathan, his son, was there found. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. And what you have here is a bad situation. And uh, I, had a, I had a picture of you of, of, of some garden utensils. Can you imagine going to war? Nobody has any weapons. Everybody's got their garden utensils. Hey, praise the Lord. It, it's not in our power, right? It's in his not in our strength, it's in his, but boy, it sure would have made some people feel better to have a sword. They didn't have the tools. They didn't have the tools. What had happened is the Philistines 
were the ones that had taken the tool making business under their control. And they intentionally withheld the tools that were necessary to be most effectual in battle from the people that needed them, which is the people of Israel. And I'm sympathetic <clears throat> to the argument many have. But Brian, the authorized version of the King James Bible is just too hard for me to read. You know, my third grade son says that sometimes. And he is working, with, and I'm not trying to be funny here, I'm being honest. He's working at a sixth grade reading level, which I'm proud of that, praise the Lord. Thank you, Mrs. Sloan. But the reality is there's words that are difficult sometimes, and I have to help explain those to him. But if you can read phonetically, you can read the Bible. The third grade reading level, no, probably not. But with a sixth grade, I think you can make it. Maybe with some help. And you know what? I'll be willing to give you all the help you need. And you know what? It might be easier than you actually think because the King James Bible actually is, is uh, rhythmic in a way that you can actually do it, read it phonetically much easier oftentimes. If you read it, some of these newer ones, they're pretty hard to understand. They got some $50 words in there. I suspect that if you're struggling with the King James, you may be struggling to read in general, which is okay. And I can help you with that. I'll do anything I can. And I'm also, and I really am, with all sincerity, I'm sympathetic to that. That's not a problem. We'll help you learn how to read. But one thing that really helped me, and this is, I'll tell my own personal testimony. Uh, because I told you, when I was young, I, I had like a, I had a couple versions of the Bible. And I've got to be honest with you, none of them made any sense to me. I, ch I preferred, even as a lost person, the King James Bible, because that's just what we had. That's what was around my house. Like I said, in my house, uh, even though they didn't use the Bible or read it, there was Bibles laying around. They were typically King James. Uh, but I had some other ones given to me, and I even went through the plan of salvation, I think, in a, in a probably a NASB or maybe a RSV. I can't remember, but it doesn't matter. None of it made any sense to me because this is the, really the biggest hurdle I had to understand in the Bible. It was the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. I could not make sense of the Bible until I received Christ as my Savior. I just, I'm not, I'm not making that up, guys. I mean, I would read it, I would struggle with it, but it was, it was boring, it was lifeless, it was, I just didn't get it because I was dead in trespass and sins. But it was amazing. The day I got saved, I'll tell you, the first, the first things that popped off the page to me, they popped off the pages. If the Word of God is, if you're, if you're dead in your sin right now, but the Word of God is popping off the page at you, and it's telling you what you need to do, you better obey it. You better obey it. Man, it freed my soul. It's amazing. After I obeyed the gospel, once I trusted Christ as Savior, man, it was awesome. Then all of a sudden, woo-hoo! I didn't understand the Bible from come to cover. I still don't understand the Bible from cover to cover. Guys, this is God's mind. You'll never get all of it. You can't mind every bit of it. But the reality is that it opens up. And you start to, and you know what you know? You know this is the real deal. This is the real McCoy. This is life-changing. So get saved. If you haven't gotten saved, start there. And I'm not saying there are not difficulties in reading the King's English. And again, I, I wouldn't say that. There are at times for, for some. But for some of us, it's like the Ethio Ethiopian eunuch. Man, he read that prophet Isaiah, but he needed someone to come alongside of him and show him, what does this mean? What does this say? Is he talking about himself or someone else? And what did Philip do? He comes along and he preached to him, Jesus. God quickened that text in his heart, and he got saved. Praise God. Another thing that will help you is get in a church that preaches and teaches the Bible. If you want to know the Bible, for goodness sake, get in a church that believes it and teaches it. It doesn't have to be this one. There's several churches that believe and teach the Bible. I, I mean, call my office. I'll try to find one for you if you don't like this one. Seriously. Get in a church that believes and teaches the Bible. And, and another thing that will help is get a dictionary. Get a dictionary. That will help too. But you say, Brian, I, I like my NIV. And I have said... I have, and by the way, I have, have I said that you cannot read an NIV or a paraphrase? I have not said that. It's a free country. You can do whatever you want. All I'm saying is that when you get to Isaiah 14, 12, that, the, that they'll call Lucifer oftentimes Jesus of the morning. And, a, and, a reliable, <clears throat> and you have a reliable word in the English that you can refer to so you know how to get that passage straight. And when you get to Acts 8, 37... 
in your net Bible or, or many of those other majority text Bibles, what they're going to tell you is verse 37 doesn't belong there. So in the, I think in the net I was looking at it, it just says, I think it was truncated or gone or omitted or whatever. It didn't even have the verse. It's gone. It's just gone. Check it out. Go look up Acts 8, 37. What's so important about that? Well, that's the part. Oh, that's no big deal. That's the part where the eunuch says, yeah, I need to call upon the name of the Lord, right? I need to confess. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Yeah, if you just read through it, it looks like you just need to get baptized to be saved. I wonder why that is. Now, I always tell our folks in the Next Steps class that we use the authorized version. That's where we take our stand. You can read anything you want. It is a free country. But if one doesn't settle on the authorized version, I'd recommend, <coughs> I'd recommend settling on something. If, you was, if you're going to go pastor a church somewhere, settle on something, for goodness sake. Don't confuse people with a hundred different versions of the Bible in this century. Settle on something and say, you have the word of God in your language. Get something that when you read it and you cross-reference it, like I read and cross-reference my authorized version, I cannot help but believe that it is the inspired, it is the preserved word of God. I just can't help but believe that. And I stand on that. My goodness, why do we want to vacillate? Why do we want to sit around and yea, hath God said world? When the, when, the, when, the, when the world itself right now is going to hell in a handbasket. What's the problem? So you take a little criticism from a scholar. Who cares? I'm going to heaven, man. That'll be over soon. And I'm going to go with my Bible that God gave me. And it's been working for the last couple hundred years. It's going to work for me the next few 1 Samuel 13 is a place that we can't afford to go. We cannot allow the enemy to take over our weapons. We cannot afford to exchange the sword for a plowshare. Oh, that's in the millennium, guys. It ain't the millennium yet. The scripture is clear in Ephesians 6 and Hebrews 4.12 that we are to hold a sharp two-edged sword, right? Not a dull garden hoe. If all I have available is a Dewey Reams Catholic Bible or an NIV, beloved, God is my witness, I have led people to Christ from both of those Bible versions. I will grab whatever is at my disposal, and I will find God's plan of salvation, and I will share it with someone, and by God's grace, through faith, they will come to Christ somehow. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not saying that you can't use other versions of the Bible and God won't use them, but I'm telling you guys this, I don't want to use a garden hoe, I don't want to use a goat, I want to use a sharp two-edged sword. If I have to lead, and I am the pastor, if I have to lead people to Christ, I'll use what I can get my hands on. But if I'm going to train men and women, I want to use the sword. I want to give you the best sword that, that I can find. If I'm asked to stand steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, having my loins, loins glittered about with truth against the forces of hell, I'm going to hold fast to the faithful word as I've been taught. And I want you to know this. This sword is sharp. It's razor sharp. It's double-sided. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and, is, and uh, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It's a sharp sword that cuts to the soul. And if God's going to ask me to take men and women to battle, I'm going to train them with farm implement? No. I'm going to place this book in their hand because it's the sharpest sword I know how to get a hold of. It's God's word. And if the translating team cannot discern Lucifer from Jesus Christ, then I don't have a lot of confidence in them. And beloved, we should not take this book lightly, for it has been proven, this book in particular, this version of your English Bible and, this, and the ones preceding it, by the way, those other six copies, not the Dewey Reams. I'm telling you guys, people have bled and died for this one, if that holds any weight with you. This particular one has a lot of blood behind it. Not a lot of money, but a lot of blood. So don't get puffed up. I got to end here. Just because you have a sharp sword doesn't mean you know how to use it. There are many faithful saints who use whatever weapon that's been delivered to them. They don't even understand the issue of preservation. They don't understand. They're just using whatever they got. And like a mighty man out of the book of Judges, they go forth with their pitchfork, beloved, and they'll do more damage with their little pitchfork than, than you'll ever do with your King James Bible because their heart's right with God. 
that we can't get puffed up in our fleshy mind. Remember that to whom much is given, much is required. And if God's able to destroy the enemy with the jawbone of an ass or an ox goad, then he certainly doesn't need you or me to win the day. But you know what, guys? He wants to use us. He wants us to have a right heart. He wants us to understand that we have a word that we can depend on. He wants us to be. We, we, he wants us to know we should be so confident in Him, and what He's given us, that we should apply ourselves in studying God's Word. That we should apply ourselves in taking advantage of discipleship and and the learning, but not just the knowledge of God's Word, but the application and the loving of other people and the living out of the truth of this Word. We should take that to heart. Why? Because it's been delivered to us, and woe to us if we know we have the Word of Truth and we don't respond. Judgment begins at the house of the Lord. God has preserved his word. Why? I can tell you why. So we can get it to the world. Are you willing to take it? Are you willing to obey the gospel? Not just the receiving, but the sending. I know you are. You're, a lot of you are the home crowd. But maybe today the spirit of God is calling you. Maybe all these issues of whatever I'm saying is just like, well, what's he talking about? I, I tell you, this is what I'm talking about. God loves you. He wants to get the message to you that he loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son on the cross that he died in your place. He faced the wrath of God so you wouldn't have to. Well, why am I facing the wrath of God? Because you're a sinner. The standard of righteousness is Jesus Christ. If you, if you keep all the law and offend in one point, the Bible says you're guilty of all. You're guilty of all. And you need, you need a Savior. Whether you believe it or not, you need a Savior. And so you've got to acknowledge where you start as a sinner. And you need to come to the Word of God and let Him show you His wonderful, wonderful news. It's called the good news, the gospel. It's powerful. As Ron was saying, it'll translate you from darkness to light. It'll change you from a sinner to a saint. Through faith in Jesus Christ and His shed blood. He died on the cross, he was buried, he rose again the third day, and he's coming back, just like he says. And if you don't respond while you can, beloved, I, I don't know what to tell you, because the days are short. Today is the day of salvation. God loves you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word.